and the beauty of the universe compel me to admit that there's some excellent and eternal being who deserves the respect and the homage of men. Well, that says it in one way. Really, if you go to his life, he was a skeptic. And yet there was so much evidence in every way he looked and so much harmony to go with that evidence and so many good things that come from that evidence that he was led to make that statement. Just being honest. And if you and I are honest, we ought to be a little bit beyond the skepticism level in appreciation for the love of God. Then you've got, now and that's a pagan background. Here's the skeptic. Not sure. The one that'd be in the realm of the agnostic. If there's a God, uh, can't know it or something. Who thou art, I know not, but this much I know, Thou hast set the Pleiades in a silver row. Stars lined up consistently that way. And many years ago, before they had all the technical and the electronic benefits they have today to guide them and chart the seas and so forth, watching those stars determined where you would sail or how you were sailing. And they depended on that because there was that consistency, a demonstration of heavenly bodies that are there. We're probably most conscious of it by a planet that comes by every 75 years. And that's been happening 75 years on time for centuries. And we take it all for granted if we're not careful because that's how big God's blessings are. We just take them for granted. It's like a rich child that can depend on so many astronomical things because of a rich daddy. And God is that way to us. For a student, Henry Sloan Coffin made the statement, God is to me that creative force behind and in the universe. He's both who manifests himself as energy. And it certainly takes a lot of that. How much would it take to move the earth about the sun one day? How about one century, one millennium? And everything we have recorded historically says that's how it's been going on for a long time. And it's a power source. Recently, due to our weather, you remember one thing they put on TV? How many lost their power? And I don't know. I think Ruth and I have lost power one time since we moved here in 1988. And it was off two or three days, but if it goes much longer, you get concerned, don't you? The deep freeze may not hold out. And yet the energy it takes to move the earth about the sun for sun up and sun down, we just take for granted because he's there and dependable. God is great. He manifests himself as energy, as life. Now start letting that run by your mind. Plant life, animal life, human life, 
angelic life. And who is supplying the oxygen or the hydrogen according to the need of the system? Plants need the hydrogen. We need the oxygen. One gives the other. We've got barely an earthly balanced aquarium where we give off hydrogen and we take in oxygen. And if we didn't have it at a balanced level, We'd all die in a few moments. A person can live, they say, around 30, 40 days, maybe without food, five days without water, five minutes without air. Life, something that we treasure, even more if we're about to lose it or someone has lost it. And we're having it day by day because God loves us. He loves you. That's the reason you're alive today. Manifests himself as energy, as life, as ardor. Now take that one down the line. I mentioned that planet every 75 years. But how about weathermen predicting a month from now what time the sun will come up over the horizon? How can they make that prediction? Are they that smart? No, God is that consistent. And we take, again, so much of it for granted. But the harmony that's there. What about the beauty? I always think, I think when we were in Hawaii and saw it went through the uh, aquarium there, fairly big on Oahu, and uh, just the sea life and the color of it. And then you step out of that to the Grand Canyon or the Tetons. or They say there's even a beauty to West Texas. I look pretty hard for it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then what about the colors? Light color better than black and white? Beauty. Now, where did we get that beauty? You know, every color of the ladies' dresses that are here and different color eyes. Even our hair changes color and sometimes we like it and sometimes we don't. But color, beauty. God loves us, doesn't he? And then the rest of that quote. Beauty as thought, as conscience. Aren't you glad people are bothered if they do wrong? Not everyone has a conscience. You can sear it. We know that from 1 Timothy 4. But conscience and then being able to love one another. So easy to read by little quick quotes and not realize how much depth and significance is really in them. So all of that led Hildebert then to make the statement, God is over all things and then under all things. Here's the mystic factors of his omnipresence. I think his brother Raymond Kelsey that I first read, I think in a book of sermons he had, that you are just as far away from God at this moment as you can ever be while on earth. And you are just as near to God at this moment as you can ever be on this earth. Ruth and I are heading out today toward Indiana. Will he be there? Not will he be there, he's already there. But we hope he's here too. And again, we kind of take that for granted, but we wouldn't have life 
for a moment if he weren't there and here. God's over all things, under all things, outside all. And while outside, yet he's within. He is outside of us, but can God dwell in our hearts? He said if we responded to his will, Christ promised us that he and the Father would come and make their abode with us and be in us. So he's outside, he's within, but not enclosed. So he can't get out. Without, but not excluded. Talk more about that later, maybe when I get to the will of God a little bit later. The will of God is much broader than many people take for granted, and that leads them off into wrong thought patterns. Above, but not raised up. Below, but not depressed, so it has to stay there. Holy above, presiding, holy beneath, sustaining. He, not Atlas, really holds up the earth. <laughs> You've seen the picture of Atlas holding. Well, give God more credit. Holy without, embracing, holy within, filling. It's an interesting quote. Just trying to say what that quartet said with the bass voice booming in it. He's everywhere. And drop that about eight notes where that bass did and just let it vibrate a little bit. And that's where God is. Everywhere. Well, in that regard, you have there the passage, John 5, 17. And I don't understand all this, and I don't think you can either. But Jesus said, while in flesh on the earth, having to eat food, I guess, to sustain his body, my Father worketh even until now, and I work. That meant he was still busy, and Father was still busy. The earth was still operating while Jesus was on earth in the flesh. And there is then what God is doing today that's simply beyond our comprehension. But I hope it's not beyond our appreciation. He's everywhere. Right there beside you. Hopefully within you. And he loves you. Aren't you glad? Jesus touched on a key important factor related to that thought when he said, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. That's why we're taking a little time on this and some rather strange expressions of all that God's doing. We may want to behave a little better today as he has commanded. Let's come to the next one, the covenants. I've asked two or three to help out on this. Deuteronomy 7, 9 through 12. Now the whole punchline is down in the first part there, A, I believe it is. No, it's down in part B. God has not left himself without witness. Aren't you glad? Because all of this is here that we understand it to some degree because he did communicate to us and give us directions. The world we inhabit must have had an origin. That origin must have consisted in a cause. That cause must have been intelligent. That intelligence must have been supreme. And that supreme must always, which always was and is supreme, we know by the name of God. If the Lord grants time and travel and all uh, later 
Ruth and I'll be up at the Golden Age encampment and I'll be speaking each day about a couple of times for six days. And one lesson that's going to be given there is designed to overcome skepticism. Uh, branches off of Hebrews 11 and 3 by faith. We understand that the worlds have been framed out of things which do not appear and so forth. But it's arguments that I've used in three or four different continents, really. And that is that there's an unseen. We haven't seen him. So you take it by faith. Intelligent. Everything we've talked about this morning proves fabulous intelligence. Unseen, intelligent, eternal. Socrates comments something is because something was, therefore something always had to be. That's God. Unseen, intelligent, eternal feeling. That's a love part. All these things that are so good is proof that he cares. Makes his son to rise where? On the evil and the good. Feeling. And when I cover the material, and not wanting to spend an hour on that right now, but I use the word power. There's an unseen power. Intelligent power. Eternal power. Feeling power. Purposeful power. Some reason for it. Many have used the idea of a watch and watchmaker is proof of that there must be a universe maker and so forth. So, purposeful power. Uniting power. God draws, pulls things together. The harmony is proof of that. And then last, there is, and that's what we're at now, communicating power. If he has all those other characteristics, or that power has all those characteristics, that power surely could communicate. And if you really love, you have feelings, and you have purposes, and you care, then, obviously, you want to communicate. Now, there are seven arguments that can be studied rationally without even opening the Bible. They take on added meaning, of course, when you now take the Bible, and I'm not going to do that today, and give passages for every one of those. No man has seen God at any time, unseen power, and you go right on down through it. Now we're at the last one, and that's a long introduction to this idea of communication. He's communicated. Deuteronomy 7 9 through 12, what does it say? Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving, loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. How and long does, does He keep it? A thousand generations. Did you know we've only been a nation about 15 generations? Take a thousand. It's just a term, really, but it's a term that just indicates He will forever be giving directions. Go ahead, Dan. But repay those who hate Him to their face to destroy them. He will not delay with Him who hates Him. He will repay Him to His face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. Then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you, keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness which he swore to your father to your forefathers. There's a dual nature of God. He'll punish if we don't keep his commandments. But that's not our study today. Our study today is the last part of what Dan read in regard to his keeping his covenants. If he gave us a promise, and he's given us a bunch of them, 
Wish we had time to just study the promises of God. But if he has done that, you can rest assured he will do it. He's reliable. And thus it closes out in that statement that Dan read of his loving kindness. That's what we're studying. His loving kindness. And when you tie that in with Proverbs 14 verse 12, there's a way it seems right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see how much we need his directions and his guidance. So dependent on him. But when one phase of what he's promised has run its course, he'll have other promises after that. An eternal God with eternal promises and benefits. So Jeremiah now, 31, 31 through 34. You ought to be able to remember that one because just remember Jeremiah 31 and you can't hardly forget it because <laughs> that's the chapter and the verse. Uh, who, who has that now? I do. Yeah, Jeremiah. Be hope the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And I will put my laws Forgive sin, iniquity remembered no more. They all shall know me. That's how much he has testified to us that we could know him so that John 17, 3 could be a reality as Jesus prayed to the Father. This is life eternal that they should know thee, the only true God and him whom you have sent. That's God's love as to covenants. And when that old covenant had finished its purpose, he then immediately kept witnessing and informing us, especially doing it through Christ, so that we have, as in Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, this new covenant. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep with the blood of an eternal covenant. This one's not going to pass away. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed a righteousness from God, from faith unto faith. It just keeps building faith. That's what it is, faith builder. And if you go on down to verse 18, therein also is revealed the wrath of God. There's the other side. We're trying to stay away from that today and just look at his love. But as given then in the outline... In Acts 14, 17, he has not left himself without witness. So a part of his love is the fact, like a father, he guides his children and seeks to help them. I'm going to come to another passage in a moment. Let's try to move on toward that. That uh, will be read out of the Psalms to really indicate how he's been with us. My, he's patient. I guess all of us, certainly those of us who've been a father 
thought at some time we were being a little bit patient because we wanted to paddle our children and we <laughs> tried to reason with them. One of the patterns I had with our children was <laughs> if they did wrong, well, we got a call once from someone that said that Dita was being detained by the police. She was, I don't know, Ruth may remember, 9, 10, 11, something like that. She had stolen something down in the, uh, one of the stores. And, uh, anyhow, she was scared to death. I mean, when you see a policeman with a 38 on his hip <laughs> walking around, it uh, kind of takes away your vigor for wanting whatever you wanted. And uh, anyhow, when we got home, I had jotted down five or six passages about stealing. Thieves, it's in here, if you know where to turn. And I'd read one and ask her if she thought that's a good course. <laughs> well, you know, it's like my dad used to do. He, he didn't do it with a book as much as he did with questions. Dayton, do you feel good about it? No. Do you, do you want to do it again? No. Are you going to ever do it again? No. He, he'd just keep chopping you down until you were about that tall. That was my dad's way. I did it with some passages, just reading them and ask her a few questions along the way. Well, she broke down crying like I did. And God has done that for every one of us, one way or another. He's given us words, wanting us to do better, and yet lets us keep living. Talk more about that in a moment. Let's move on. I like this statement. He sendeth sun, he sendeth shower, alike they're needful to the flower, and joys and tears alike are sent to give the soul fit nourishment. As comes to me are cloud or sun, Father, thy will, not mine, be done. That's where it ought to lead us, to want to abide by what he said because his commandments are not only out of loving kindness but good for each one of us. Now evident even more by the last or third section on God's love, crucifixion. There of course is Christ's part. He's the one that's on the cross. But if you have ever seen one of your children really suffer, try to watch Jesus die on the cross. Watch them spit on him. Watch them beat him. And know that as a God of power, you could lamb blast the whole group off the face of the earth. And you let it happen. You think he don't love? The self-control he demonstrated is beyond our grasp to let Jesus die on the cross and even hear from him, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's all because he is bearing our sins in his body on the tree. Now that's Christ's love, which we'll be studying, Lord willing, next Sunday. But turn over now on the next page. And this starts at the bottom of page 19. Roger Levitt gave us this statement. A pastor visited a family whose son had been killed in an automobile accident. He heard the mother rail at him. Where was your God when my boy was killed? And he quietly said, the same place he was when his son was killed. It's a good answer. He put up so much. In this book, I've got on page 101, I believe, the moment in India when Brother Johnson had mentioned to me that someone up in his office wanted to talk to me. 
and I had a break from class and I went there to see this man somewhat heated and uh, he was reacting to what we were doing there and teaching the Bible. I don't know if he had a background of the national religion there or what really all his background may have been, but I know what his statements were. He said, how could God be all powerful and let so many of my people in India starve to death and die of all kinds of terrible diseases? If he's all powerful and God is love, why would he happen? He thought he had a valid argument, but that knocks God out of the picture. I said to him, are you married? And he said, yes, I'm married. Do you have any children? He said, yes, we have five children. I said, do you and your wife love your children? And he said, of course we love our children. And I said, can your children get sick? And he said, that's what I'm talking about. As if that was further proof of his argument against God. I said, did you know that your children not only could get sick, but would one day die? And he said, well, yes, they'll die. Of course, we don't want it to happen. We don't want them to get sick. I said, could one of your children do wrong? And he said, well, I'm sure they have and will. I said, don't tell me you love your children. You're a liar. And I said it pretty bluntly. And he looked at me quite hard. I said, don't tell me you love your children if you brought them into a world where they can get sick, where your children can do wrong, when your children can die. Don't tell me you love your children. And then he kind of smiled, and I did too. He got the point. He said, you mean if I know I love my children and I brought them in a world like that, that God could let people come into a world like this and love them? I said, you're 100% right except in one area. If your children get into some kind of sickness someday and when your children die, there's not one thing you can do about it. But death is no problem to God. He can raise the dead. And he said, I guess I hadn't thought about it like that. That's what I was talking about a few moments ago when I said you don't understand the will of God unless you study it in three dimensions. There is the ideal will of God where he's communicated to us, had covenants for us, shown love to us. There's the ultimate will of God when one day we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But in between, there's the allowed will of God. And that's why he would cause his son to rise on what? The evil and the good. Send his reign on the just and the unjust. Matthew 5, 45. And thus, God has allowed a lot. And the devil and sin have often brought on perils and problems to people. Not God. And that's his allowed will, which you and I have because we get to make a choice. And we can choose what's good or many choose what's bad. And we get in trouble. And we hurt one another. And we disobey God. That's the human trend. But God's love is as evident to you at this moment as the next breath of air you take. Behold how much he loves us.
bring back the outline on the love of Christ, Lord willing, we'll hope to be looking at that next because that's another dimension of God's love demonstrated through the Son of God. Appreciate you being here. Good study today. I like the positive side a lot more than all those bad things we do. Appreciate your presence.